So remember that vision Lucy had right before she wrote down the third secret? The tip of the spear as a flame touches the Earth's axis, and then earthquakes and floods and war and massive death? Turns out that wasn't the first time she saw that vision, and her language was a bit clearer on some points in the other version. And somehow I seem to be the first person on the internet to talk about this, at least according to Google. So let me not waste your time, here it is. On page 225 of A Pathway Under the Gaze of Mary, they reproduce a letter that Lucy wrote to the Bishop of Fatima. It doesn't give a date for it, but it implies that it's after 1935, and definitely before December 1940. The whole truth about Fatima Volume 2 appears to reference the same letter. It only gives one line from it, and it doesn't give the original Portuguese, so I can't compare if it's word for word exactly the same. But if it is the same letter, then it confirms it's from 1940. I'm just going to read you part of it, see if any of this sounds familiar. Most Reverend Bishop, I was very impressed with Jacinta, that's the name of a biography that was written about Jacinta that somebody sent her to review, with some of the things revealed in secret, and in her love for the Holy Father and for sinners. She said to me many times, Poor Holy Father, I feel sorry for sinners. If she was living now when these things are so close at hand, how much more it is evident. If the world only knew that moment when grace is still granted if they do penance. Time passes, the souls do not die, and eternity remains. I see in the immense light that is God. The earth is shaken and trembles before the breath of his voice. Cities and villages buried, destroyed, defenseless people swallowed by the hills. I see the falls amid thunder and lightning, rivers and seas overflowing and floods, and souls sleeping in the sleep of death. Men still keep on plotting wars, ambitions, destruction, and death. And then there are ellipses. I really wish that there weren't ellipses, because that means they cut something out, and I would really like to know what it is and why they felt the need to remove it. When the text resumes, she's moved on to a completely different subject, so I'll just stop there. Did you catch it? It's an almost line-for-line -line parallel of the vision of the tip of the spear. The only difference structurally is that near the end of the vision in the diary, she has a line explaining that this is the purification of the world because of sin, whereas in the letter she establishes that contextually before she begins. It's really obvious when you see them lined up side by side like this. I think the reason nobody noticed it before is because the letter actually comes 19 pages before the vision. And on first glance, it doesn't seem like anything interesting. It seems like she's just artfully describing the current moral state of the world using apocalyptic language. By the time you got to the actual vision, you probably wouldn't even have remembered it. It's only the sort of thing you'd catch if you had read the vision first a million times and memorized every line like I ended up doing, and then went and read the biography cover to cover. Or maybe other people have noticed and just didn't think it was worth pointing out because only a big Fatima nerd like me would find a minor variation on a vision we already know about to be interesting. But it's actually pretty important. If you combine the two texts, it narrows down the possible interpretations on a number of points that I raised in my last video. So I wanted to just go through it line by line like before and talk about what this changes. And I'll throw a summary at the end like last time if you want to just skip ahead. First of all, we have to ask, if she saw this before that night when she wrote down the third secret, when was the first time she saw it? And if you're like me, your immediate response is probably, well, it must have been in the third secret, of course. I mean, when else could it have been? But if you think about it for a minute, that's not really possible. First of all, recall that until that night in January 1944, she had been almost physically unable to write down the third secret, even after multiple direct orders from her immediate superiors and her bishop. It wasn't until Our Lady gave her that special grace that she was able to put pen to paper without her hand shaking uncontrollably. So even if this was a disguised and paraphrased version of something from The Secret, it's still hard to imagine her writing it down of her own volition. Secondly, she apparently had no expectation of privacy with anything that she wrote down, and she didn't trust the postal system at all. Right after she finished writing down the third secret, she wrote to her bishop saying, If your excellency desires that I send it, I will deliver it to the first reliable carrier that arrives here. Or if your excellency wants to seek it in Valencia, I'll take it there. I'm afraid to mail it for fear that it may become lost. Another time in 1949, she wrote to the Archbishop of Coimbra about a conversation that they had had where she felt unable to speak freely because of the company they were in. In the letter she says, Patience, it is for when you return here. I'm not saying here what it is because I do not trust anything on paper. And then there was the time when she secretly wrote to the Pope to get permission to become a Carmelite. She wrote in her diary, I went upstairs, walked into my room, and wrote. I did not keep a copy so I would not expose myself to being found out. The next day, just before parting, I gave the letter to Father McGlynn, asking once again for his absolute secrecy. So even in her own room, she was afraid of people rifling through her stuff. That makes it very unlikely that anything in her diary is explicitly from the third secret. Originally, she was afraid to talk about anything even tangentially related to the secret. Remember that time when Jacinta saw the vision of the field full of people crying with hunger, and she asked Lucy a few days later, Can I say that I saw the Holy Father and all those people? 
And Lucy responded, No, don't you see that that's part of the secret? If you do, they'll find out right away. Now, she became a little less strict about that eventually, because obviously we know about this vision, and she talked about Russia being the instrument of the chastisement, and in her last memoir she added that line, In Portugal the dogma of the faith will be preserved, etc. So we know that eventually she became comfortable with giving out certain hints about the third secret and talking about things tangentially related to it. And that's still what I think the vision of the tip of the spear is. It's not in the secret, but it's a vision of something that's talked about in the secret. I mean, it literally says, it is the purification of the world because of sin, and it shows people dying on a global scale, and Our Lady showed it to her immediately after telling her to write down the third secret. You'd have to stretch pretty hard to interpret that as anything other than the annihilation of nations. So getting back to the question, if the vision wasn't in the third secret, then when did she see it? The biography presents what might be an attempted explanation of this. Right before the letter, they say, She wrote as if obeying an inspiration, and moved by the Spirit of God, she almost did not even realize what she wrote. When I first read that, I thought it was just empty verbiage there to fill in space, because there's quite a bit of that. But after I realized what was in the letter, I went back and immediately thought, They know what this is. You can't write something like this biography and not see a connection as obvious as this. They knew that this was another version of the same vision. That vision they thought was so important that they included a scan of the handwritten diary page. And then I found out that I was right, because I went back and read the vision of the tip of the spear, and in literally the next paragraph they explicitly point this out. This part of the secret was kept in the silence of her heart, and only later revealed in her intimate notes, which she called My Pathway. Without appearing as someone in contact with the invisible, it seems that it was usual for her to see in God, as in a mirror, a film of the life of humanity. Some years earlier, in a letter to the Bishop of Liaria, and moved by the Spirit of God, as mentioned above, she reported a scenario very similar to this one when speaking of Blessed Jacinta. She never gave a word of personal opinion as to the meaning of these visions, affirming always the interpretation belongs to the Church. So yeah, I'm stunned that nobody else has talked about this. I mean, it's still a little hard to notice because they don't actually tell you that the letter they're talking about was 20 pages before this one, but still, there's no way I'm the first person who's noticed this. The first time I read that paragraph, I misunderstood it. I thought they were talking about the vision of the bishop in white, the part that Our Lady told her not to write down, the interpretation of it. But that wasn't recorded in my pathway, her diary. That was written on a sheet of paper, which was sealed in an envelope, which was in turn stuffed in between the pages of a notebook and handed to the Bishop of Gerza, who later delivered it to the Bishop of Fatima. Now that I know what's in this letter that they were talking about, it's clear that they're talking about the vision of the tip of the spear, which raises two interesting points. For one, they compare it to a film of the life of humanity. That might mean they think it was a literal vision of the future. In fact, on the next page when they describe their interpretation of what purification of the world means, they open up with a quote from a private conversation with Lucy where she said, God does not punish man, it is man himself who with his intemperance causes punishments. I wonder if they also believe that this is all caused by a weapon. But more interestingly, they call it part of the secret. Which really stands out because in the next paragraph they claim that Lucy said the whole secret was revealed in 2000. But this vision wasn't revealed until just now, in this book, on this page, in 2013. So either that's a lie, or it's not part of the secret. Now, this is being written by Lucy's fellow sisters, who aren't supposed to know what the real third secret is, and probably don't. I don't think that they literally meant that it's in the text of the secret of July 13th, 1917, just that it shows something from the secret, and maybe gives some details that even the text of the secret doesn't have. And that may not even mean the third secret, they may just mean that it refers to the annihilation of nations mentioned in the second secret. The reason they worded it in a way that appears to be a flagrant contradiction is probably a hint that they're being forced to toe the party line, but they don't actually believe it. Still, it is interesting to know that, in some way or other, they consider it part of the secret. Anyway, back to the issue of when she first saw this. They said that she wrote the letter as if obeying an inspiration and moved by the Spirit of God. That's either them subtly alluding to the fact that this is from a divine vision, or they're trying to say that Lucy felt inspired to share this vision with the bishop, because honestly I don't have any other reason why she would, or they're trying to say she didn't actually see this vision yet, that God inspired her imagination to come up with this scene, and that 9 to 14 years later he would show her the actual vision. That doesn't make any sense to me. I don't see any reason for God to do that. And I imagine it would be a confusing experience for Lucy to be shown a vision that she had imagined up, or maybe seen in a dream, years before. Why not just show it to her? Moreover, she begins the vision with, I see in the immense light that is God. This is a key phrase that she used when describing a direct communication into her soul from God. In all of the writings that I have from her, there are only three other times that she uses that expression. 
The first is to describe the light that shone from Our Lady's hands during the apparitions themselves, which she said communicated information directly to her soul without words. It's the same light that showed them the vision of hell. The second is the light in which they saw the vision of the bishop in white, and the last is the light that showed her the vision of the tip of the spear. This is not by accident. I'm positive that this is her way of quietly telling us that what she's writing here comes from God, not from her imagination. So ruling that out, the only answer we're left with is that Our Lady showed her the vision at some random time that we don't know about, somewhere between the apparitions and 1940. I can't think of any other meaningful incident that Lucy's told us about where it would have been relevant. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start with line one. There's not much in line one, they're pretty much the same. The only significant difference is that in the diary version she says that she saw and heard all of this, whereas in the letter she just says that she saw it. I didn't talk about this last time, but there is an audio track to this vision. My take on it is that it's just sound effects, the rumbling of the earth and the roaring of the flood waves and the screams of the dying people. That would explain why her heart was racing at the end of it. For someone who had never seen a movie before, that would have been pretty horrifying. But the other way that you could interpret it is that she heard the words that follow, that Our Lady narrated the vision to her. That would explain why the wording is different from the letter. The version in the letter would be her description of what she saw in her own words, whereas in the diary it's the words Our Lady used to describe the vision. I'm less inclined to believe that though, because the wording in the diary is really vague and confusing, even just from a grammatic standpoint. Everything Our Lady said at Fatima was worded really clearly. This seems much more like something that Lucy would say. The second line is the biggest difference. Instead of the tip of the spear causing the earth to tremble by touching its axis, it's caused by the breath of the voice of God. Now you could look at that and say that because that's obviously generic apocalyptic language that doesn't tell us anything, that the tip of the spear was meant to be the angel's sword from the vision of the bishop in white. In other words, another form of generic apocalyptic language that wasn't meant to tell us anything. This version does lend some credence to that idea, but not much. I think all of the arguments I made against that before still hold. The more likely reason for the difference in wording here is just that Lucy was trying to disguise this as her own creation. If she had said something as specific and cryptic as the tip of the spear as a flame unlatches and touches the axis of the earth, there's no way that would have flown. It would have been immediately obvious that she was speaking of something she had seen rather than just using colorful language. Whereas the presence of God is often described as the reason for the earth's trembling in the Bible. In fact, just to give you an idea of how easily this whole thing could pass as a reference to a Bible passage, here's a couple of lines from Ezekiel 38 that I ran across recently. In my zeal and fiery wrath I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. Almost exactly the same sequence of events from lines 2 and 3. I mean, just the fact that this letter has been public for the last four years and nobody's talked about it testifies to how well disguised it is. The next line clears up a few things. First of all, it's part of the same sentence as the previous line. The colon that separates them implies that it's the shaking of the earth that causes the subsequent destruction. In the diary, it was only implied by the fact that one came after the other. Here it's a little more explicit. It also clarifies that when it says mountains, cities, towns, and villages will be buried, it means they will be destroyed. I had assumed that because, again, what else could they be buried under other than their own rubble? But it's nice to get confirmation on that. So we're definitely talking about quaking that's strong enough to destroy mountains, or significantly change them. But both versions use the word buried to describe the destruction. That's important because it's most likely telling us something about the manner in which the destruction occurs. When I posted my last video, one of the most common alternative theories I heard was that the trembling of the earth was purely symbolic, and the destruction of mountains and cities and villages was caused by bombs, not by earthquakes, or bombs that caused earthquakes. My response was that, first of all, bombs don't cause significant earthquakes unless you're talking about underground nuclear testing. And second of all, buried would be a weird word to describe something being blown up. But now that I think about it, the end result of a bombing campaign, even a nuclear bomb outside of ground zero where everything's just vaporized, is rubble. You could say that bombs bury a city in rubble in the same way that an earthquake buries a city in rubble. I would still argue that that's counter to the sense of the text, but it's not an invalid interpretation. Even the destruction of mountains, which is not something that usually happens when nuclear bombs get dropped, could be explained by bunker buster nukes targeting military facilities underneath mountains. I wouldn't think that there's enough of those for it to be worth mentioning in the vision, but again, it's not an impossible interpretation. But now in this new version of the vision, it says that people will be swallowed by the hills. I googled that phrase, and it looks like in modern English, people use that expression to describe someone disappearing over the horizon. Obviously that's not a cause of death, so that's not what we're talking about here. 
I also googled it in Portuguese and I got no results at all, so it's not some Portuguese expression either. My immediate thought was that she's pulling this language from a famous scene in the Bible, number 16, which says the earth opened its mouth and swallowed Kor and his followers who were rebelling against Moses and Aaron. Literally every translation on Bible Hub uses the verb swallow. That's often regarded as an earthquake, but whether or not it was, it looks like we're talking about fissures opening in the earth and people falling into them. If you go with a very literal interpretation, it could mean people being buried by crumbling mountains and hills, or in other words, landslides. But a crack in the ground opening and closing on someone is better suited to the metaphor of being swallowed, so that's how I read it. So why is this important? Bombs do not cause fissures. And if they did, nobody would fall into them because they would be in the blast radius. Same with landslides. So as far as I'm concerned, this combined with the fact that the trembling of the earth is connected more directly with the destruction of the mountains and cities is near definitive proof that Lucy is talking about earthquakes. And if this line indicates fissures opening in the ground, that gives us another hint at the strength of these earthquakes. As it turns out, even earthquakes very rarely cause fissures, and when they do, they don't look like this. This is Hollywood. They usually look more like this. Little ditches a couple of feet deep that are unlikely to kill you. That's not to say that stuff like the Rebellion of Kor never happens. In fact, there was a simulation published just this year that showed that it is theoretically possible for the Earth to open and suddenly close like that. We've just never caught it on camera. I had said that being crushed by debris and drowning would be the most common causes of death during the Annihilation event, but if people falling into fissures is happening frequently enough that it merited being explicitly shown in the vision, then there must be some pretty big ones opening up, emphasizing again how incredibly powerful these earthquakes have to be, and lending some credence to Father Malachi Martin's assertion that parts of continents will break off. In fact, if that's the case, then when she says that cities will be buried, she may actually mean buried under the ground. Realistically, that would probably mean the rubble getting half buried in small fissures or sinking into the ground due to liquefaction. But the idea of entire cities falling into fissures is not any more crazy than parts of the continent breaking off, so I wouldn't rule that out. The next line has some important changes. It begins with, I see the falls amid thunder and lightning. This is a bit of a bad translation. I thought falls referred to the previous line, either the mountains and cities falling, or people falling into the hills, or falling in death, as you would say somebody falls in battle. But the Portuguese word that was translated as falls is actually cataratas, which literally translates to cataracts or waterfalls. That could be referring to the flood waves and tsunamis crashing down, but in both Portuguese and English, the word cataracts can also be used to describe torrential rain. That seems like the more likely possibility, given that the mention of thunder and lightning takes the place of the odd phrase from the other version, the clouds emerge from their limits overflowing. Originally, I had figured this either referred to windstorms or rain, but if thunder and lightning were involved, then that's a pretty solid indication of rain. In that case, the weapon that causes all of this would have to evaporate a lot of polar ice or ocean water. Given the ludicrous amounts of energy required to do everything in the previous line, that's not too unbelievable. And in fact, this idea connects with the miracle of the sun. Remember how I mentioned it's a common theory that the miracle was a preview of what the chastisement will look like? Well, some of the witnesses during the miracle described an intense heat, like being in a steam room, and after it was over, the ground and their clothes were all dried out. That could be meant to represent an intense heat created by the weapon, causing mass evaporation. Alternatively, it's still possible that we're talking about a war of weather weapons, and that these rainstorms are being created by separate weapons than the ones that created the earthquakes. That seems less likely to me, not only because of the way that the vision ties all of the events together, but because from a military standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense to waste time creating thunderstorms or even hurricanes when you can create earthquakes and tsunamis on the scale that we're talking about. They could be useful against targets in the air or on the ocean, but if all you're trying to do is assert your power or cause a lot of economic damage, it's really overkill to do both. And if the country that had the rain weapon didn't have the earthquake weapon, retaliating would not be a smart move. Hurricanes could never hope to do as much damage as the earthquakes we've been talking about. Even the hurricanes on Jupiter wouldn't be strong enough to take out a mountain. It would be like Hiroshima, they would be crazy not to surrender. So if any part of this event is intentional, then the rainstorms are likely just a side effect. But this line introduces a third possibility I'd never even considered. What if the overflowing of the clouds is just lightning, not rain? What if the weapon bombards the Earth with electromagnetic energy in such a way that lightning starts shooting out of every cloud big enough to accumulate a charge? Electromagnetic forces are on top of my list of possibilities for the mechanism that could be used to cause the earthquakes, so that would fit well. This potentially ties with the miracle of the sun, too. Remember how I said that the colors spinning off from the sun could represent an aurora effect created by the weapon interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere? Well, an aurora is made of plasma, which is created by subjecting different gases to a strong electromagnetic field. The color of the plasma is based on what gas it's created from and how much energy it's given. 
Normally, they're created from the collision of coronal mass ejections from the sun with charged particles in the Van Allen belt, but you can produce the same thing with ionized gas and a strong magnetic field. Lightning, for example, is plasma. Electricity in and of itself is no more visible than magnetism. What you're actually seeing when you see an arc of electricity is air being turned into plasma by the electrical energy. Earth's atmosphere of nitrogen and oxygen has the potential to produce all of the colors that were observed at the miracle, but getting them all to appear in succession like that would be quite a feat. It gets even harder if it's supposed to look exactly like the miracle. Presumably the silver disc represented the weapon, so somehow a rotating aura of colored light would have to be surrounding it. I want to say that's either a plasma ring or a plasma vortex, and the spinning motion is caused by a Lorenz force, but I'm just spitballing. I'm not a physics major, and this isn't an area I feel like I have a good grasp on. What I'm getting at is that plasma is an electrical phenomenon, so it sounds reasonable that both lightning and auroras could be created by a weapon putting out tremendous electromagnetic energy. Now, having said all of that, let me point out that the overflowing of the clouds is associated with the overflowing of the seas and the rivers as something that is going to carry away houses and people. Pure lightning storms will not do that. So either this sentence is poorly structured, or we are in fact talking about rainstorms. There could still be hurricane force winds, or an unusual amount of lightning. They're not mutually exclusive, but we're definitely talking about rain that's heavy enough to cause flooding. The next line is pretty much the same as in the diary. I mean, you could be really pedantic and say that the diary didn't explicitly say that the people who are carried away by the floods die, but I don't think anybody really doubted that. And finally, the last line, which I think is the most interesting one. Originally, we were told hatred and ambition caused the destructive war. In the machine translations, it just says cause destructive war. So that told us there's a war involved here somewhere. But it didn't tell us whether that war starts here, or ends here, or this is somewhere in the middle of it. But then in the letter, she says, men still keep on plotting wars, ambitions, destruction, and death. You could interpret that really generally to mean men go on having wars like they have always had wars from the beginning of time which is like saying water continues to be wet. It's not saying anything. It would make no sense to me for her to put some random sociological statement about the futility of human endeavors at peace here at the end of this thing. So even standing by itself, but especially when combined with the version from the diary, this seems to be indicating that there were one or more wars going on already before this event happened, and that one or more of them continue going on afterward. Now that may not sound too significant, because there's always a war going on somewhere. In fact, the United States has been involved in a military action somewhere in the world every day for at least the last several decades. But we're not just talking about any war here. At least some of these are specifically fueled by ambition and emphasized as especially destructive. That rules out a few things. It's possible for a civil war to be fueled by ambition, but very rarely is it. Same thing goes with terrorism, so we're probably not talking about a civil war or a little regional conflict or an anti-terror campaign. Russia is almost certainly involved based on everything else we know. And multiple wars involving global superpowers could be another way of referring to a world war. That might be why in the diary the word war is ambiguously singular, whereas here in the letter it's definitely plural. But whatever the case, there's definitely some kind of significant war going on at the time of the annihilation event. That's kind of good news, because it means we'll get at least some amount of warning before this happens. Personally, I suspect it'll start out as a proxy war between the US and Iran, with Russia providing support, but avoiding direct engagement with US forces, similar to what went on in Syria, that eventually escalates into full-scale war between global superpowers. War with China is another possible avenue, maybe sparked by something with North Korea, which would result in Russia getting involved because of treaty agreements. This war could start days before the event, or years before the event, but at least it's some kind of sign to look for. Which brings us to today. First of all, it doesn't look like anything significant happened on May 13th or October 13th. We may find out someday that there was some secret meeting or some obscure political event that happened on one of those days relevant to Fatima, but right now it looks like there was nothing. I saw a few videos claiming that there was a repeat of the Miracle of the Sun in Nigeria, but this is clearly not the Miracle of the Sun. The clouds haven't parted, the sun's not moving, there are no colors, this guy's putting on sunglasses to look at it, it's just not the Miracle. There have been a lot of flashing sun videos this year, but I've seen them before. There are some that go back even five years, so even if this is miraculous, it's definitely not unique. But I still think 2017 is the beginning of the period that leads into this event. As I outlined last time, there was a six-year period of increasing tension, persecution, and eventually bloodshed between the centenary of the request made to the King of France and the rise of Napoleon. And if you really want to draw it out, it was actually 14 years until the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, but there was plenty of bloodshed by the six-year mark, so we'll just stick with that number. Based purely on the comparison to the King of France incident, it would make more sense for the period to start in 2029, the centenary of the request for the consecration, 
But based on current events, it's pretty hard for me to imagine us getting that far without everything falling apart. We also currently have the Bishop and White situation. Benedict is about 91 years old, so that can't go on for much longer. So if the King of France parallel holds true, then we'd expect to see a period of rising turmoil leading into a major war and eventually culminating in the Annihilation event somewhere before the end of 2023. If not, then we look to 2029, with a similar six-year period of ramping up after that. And if nothing happens by then, then I give up, which is wrong. So, quick summary. We don't know when the first time Lucy saw the vision was, but it was definitely before the end of 1940. The way this new version is written more strongly connects the trembling of the earth with the destruction and flooding that follow, but it's still open to interpretation. And based on the mention of people being swallowed by the hills, it's almost completely certain now that when she says mountains and cities are buried, she's talking about earthquakes, which would have to be unnaturally powerful to destroy mountains and create a lot of fissures like that. We've also learned that the phrase, the clouds emerge from their limits, meant heavy rain causing floods. But the storms may also include powerful winds or an unnatural amount of lightning. And finally, this version implies that there was a war already going on before this event happened that continues going on afterward. And that's it. That's all I wanted to add. I know it wasn't as interesting as the last video, but I thought that the new version of the vision was important enough to share. This is probably the last Fatima video I'll do, unless there's some major development in the future. Thanks everyone. God bless.